and minimalists. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Minimalist Podcast, where we discuss what it means to live a meaningful life with less. My name is Joshua Fields Milburn. And I'm Ryan Nicodemus, and together we are the Minimalists. Today, we're going to talk about fame. We're going to talk about notoriety. We're going to talk about the difference between being famous and being well-known. And we're going to talk about the upsides and downsides of stardom with today's guest. Jeanette McCurdy is here, an actual famous person, yeah. Ryan. <laughs> Thanks so much for being here. Thanks for having me, guys. I think you're probably like the most famous person that's been on our podcast so far. Really? Uh, yeah. That's well, wait. Well, I guess it depends on who you ask. <laughs> no, I, you I guys totally agree with are that. Doing yeah. the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're insane. So, that's so, crazy. So, um, you probably know Jeanette from uh, iCarly, Sam McCat. She's she's an actress. She is a singer, writer, producer, director. We'll talk about a lot of that. I also want to talk about how we first met. But first, uh, just a quick update for our audience. Um, we're getting ready to go on tour, the the Les Coast tour. Yes. And we're going to be in eight cities, U.S. and, and, and Canada. And we had a bit of a, a small problem with the venue. So I just want to give people an update here. All of the events are now teenager friendly. We, we had a bit of a problem oh. where there were like three or four of the venues where it was like, like you have to be 18 or 21. Mm. And so we had to go back to the venues and sort of work it out with each of them. And, and so now every venue is teenager friendly. If you want to check out the city that we're going to be in closest to you, Head on over to theminimalists.com slash tour. Mm. All right, Jeanette, we, we met. Um, I was walking through a parking lot, and you were shouting out a window <laughs> at me. <laughs> yeah, uh, I was going to see a movie, and I had literally just been listening to your podcast, like, 10 minutes before I pulled up. Well, I was with my boyfriend. He pulled up. Um, and it was the, meeting you was – there was nothing I was more invested in at that time in my life than your guys' podcast. Like, it was my life. It was, the th you know when you get obsessed with a thing and oh, it's yeah. like the oh, thing wow. that dictates every decision that you make? That's where I was at. I was listening to just insane amounts of your podcast. <laughs> um, so then to see you walk past, there was a second where I was like, was it? Was that really him? Like, I couldn't even believe it. And then I think I just like shouted your name out the window or something <laughs> embarrassing. Uh, but then you were so nice. You like weren't taken off guard. You were, you know, just easy going. Well, I, I I get recognized occasionally, but nowhere near the level uh, that you do. And so I, I want to talk about that today because there are sort of these these varying levels and you had to deal with it from a very young age. Yeah. Um, and, and so we're going to uh, we're going to dive into that. But it's as you know, it's a very listener driven show. So I thought maybe what we could do is we start the conversation by answering some questions. And so we have a question here from Lauren in Tampa, Florida. Hi, this is Lauren calling from Tampa, Florida. Um, it seems that in our society, we enjoy seeing people succeed. And people, of course, love to share their successes on social media. But why is it that we also seem to get so much satisfaction from seeing people fail? So, so Jeanette, you, we, I think this is true. You, you have people who are really rooting for you. They want you to succeed. They yeah. want to um, watch whatever you're doing next. But... There are also other people who, who it seems like no matter what you do, you can never do right in, in their eyes. Why do we think that is? It's, it's an interesting area because I think, like I can speak, I guess, specifically to the kind of like child stardom, teenage stardom thing. Because uh, I feel like that's what people are even more interested, like people are even more interested in seeing a former child star mm -hmm. fail, right? Like mm -hmm. I, there's like Lindsay Lohan, Britney Spears, I mean, Macaulay Culkin, Justin Bieber even. there. It's like there's the, the idea of pulling down their narrative and making them into this crazy like men, person having a mental breakdown. I don't, I don't understand the fascination with it. I wish that wasn't the case. Mm -hmm. I think it perpetuates whoever's experiencing probably some real mental health struggles. It makes it worse for them. I wish mm. that society didn't do that to people. It bothers me so much. Um, God, it bothers me so much. I don't know what needs to change or how it can change. I was actually watching a documentary on Lindsay Lohan the other day and a paparazzi dude was interviewed. He was like, somebody was following him and he's like, I don't get why she doesn't like me. I don't get why she doesn't want to smile for the camera. Like, shouldn't she love this? I'm giving her attention. Shouldn't she love this? Mm. No, you're chasing her down. Like you're following her. Why would she love it? It doesn't make any sense to me, you know? Yeah. Well, and, but I think it makes sense to him because that's what he wants. He wants someone to, he wants that level of attention or at least 
Uh Let let me rephrase that. That's what he thinks he wants. Right. Until he gets it. Now, Ryan and I have this weird sort of level of we're not famous, but we are well known enough that occasionally people recognize us. Oh, what I get recognized all the time when I'm with Josh. (laughs) (laughs) Well, that's what I wanted to ask you guys. I was curious how much people like... It, like, is it normal for people to shout out their windows? How often does this happen? Yeah, I mean, yeah. it's five, six times a day maybe, but yeah. it's not It's not enough where it's like, if I'm walking through a crowd, it's one out of 50 people maybe. Okay. And so like, it's not, it, but you never know who that one out of 50 people are, right? Yeah. And, and if it's one out of 50 people who say something, then it's what, another four or five who don't say something. Mm. But still, it's the vast, vast majority have no idea who we are. And I'm, I'm completely contented with that. But there is a there is a level, and it's sort of like it's sort of like grains of sand. Like how many grains of sand make a beach, right? Like mm. at some point, there's a level where it is a beach, but you know, one grain of sand is not a beach. Like what is the level of notoriety that makes a person famous? Mm. I don't know. But from a very young age, you had to deal with with being recognized, and 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 uh, how were you? How did you deal with that early on? It was not easy. I think some people are naturally just kind of good at fame, like maybe their personality type or family history. I'm I, I'm not sure what makes a person good at fame, but I was I felt incredibly anxious. Like there was there was a time. Now it's totally it's completely manageable. It's not difficult at all. It it doesn't feel like a hindrance on my life. But there is a time from probably 14 years old to 22 where. I couldn't leave the house without, you know, without paparazzi, without mm. just hordes of people anywhere I went, any a grocery store or, you know, wherever. And I I think it made life so difficult. I, I mean, I, I don't think young people should be allowed to be famous. Like right. if there's somebody who could come in and say, no, they can't, this is, they're not mentally capable of handling this. I think that should happen. Um, Cause I, it just, you know, the thing with former child stars having breakdowns makes so much sense to me because I think the world that you're thr- thrust into kind of like puts you right in line to have a breakdown. Yeah. Well, there's this thing, it's it's so abnormal to have people follow you around and want, your, uh, want to capture the moment with you. Mm-hmm. But then at some point it becomes normal to you, even though it's still a very abnormal thing. Mm-hmm. And I think when it becomes normal, especially to a kid, man, you are setting that person up for failure mm-hmm. as an adult because then there's one of my favorite lines from a book uh, called Freedom by Jonathan Franzen. I don't know if you read it, but uh, one of the characters is a musician and he's famous and he talks about fame being the thing that he never want, that he doesn't want, but de- also doesn't want to live without. Hmm. And it's like this weird sort of thing where like you you don't want that, but also at the same time, if he were to lose it, he would maybe lose a part of his identity in a way. Your identity might mm-hmm. get wrapped, especially as a kid, get wrap, gets wrapped up into that who I am as, as a person is this this famous entity. Maybe so. I always saw, like I don't relate to the, I definitely just did not want to be famous. I didn't, I didn't like the experience and I couldn't wait till I could just like, you know, put that aside. But um yeah, I wonder what he was finding, like what he was latching on to in the fame. I guess the identity thing makes sense. I feel like particularly for actors, maybe there's there's a bit of an identity crisis with being famous because you're famous for something that's not you. Like maybe it's easier for Oprah or somebody who's like doing something they're proud of and it's them and, you know, or I assume she's proud of. Uh, I hope she's proud of what she's done. But I think if it's acting, it's sort of like you're known for this thing that's not even you so you know who am i underneath that and would i be famous if it were just me my character's the famous thing yeah um i think there's a lot of i'm sure people are like hey sam or or whatever like all all the time yeah Mm -hmm. and and with us it's similar it's never very rarely it's like hey josh or hey ryan it's hey minimalist dude uh, when i get a lot of time they're like are you one of the minimalists i'm like yeah they're like i don't know which one you are (laughs) 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 but i know you're one of the minimalists you know, I think the the thing with the line you were quoting from Freedom is that we all need some significance in life. Yeah. So fame, uh, I think, will certainly give you that feeling of significance in people's lives. So maybe that's mm. what he's trying to hold on to is that that significance. So maybe yeah. you know the answer to like that that whole uh, that sentence that you were quoting there was you know find a way to be significant 
in a meaningful way. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's maybe it. And it's it. Well, the significance thing is also what Lauren's question is talking about here. Why yeah. do people tear other people down? Because they want to feel Dude, it's significant. It's so yeah, common. Yeah, yeah, There's yeah. a Schadenfreude is the word. Yeah. Like, because it's such a common thing. Right. I, I think, I think, right. I think one of the reasons why people like to see people fail is because they will see someone like a child actor, for example, and how good they are at their craft, how happy they are, how they have the, the rich and, you know, famous lifestyle. But then when they fail, they can say to themselves, ah, oh, yeah, I knew it wasn't that good. Yeah, yeah, yeah I knew yeah. it because like a piece of them want that. But then when they see someone fail, they're like, oh, maybe, oh, yeah, I really didn't want that because it's it's uh, it's not all that it's cracked up to be. The other thing, too, I think, is it also gives people permission to not start down a certain road. See, that's why not, I never even started to go down that road of fame because that's where it always gets you. It's like this. Hmm. I would have been a great actor, but that's why I decided not to do it. Exactly. It's like <laughs> this uh, affirmation or something where it gives, yeah. Yeah, it gives permission well, uh, to people to, to yeah to, to to never even start on a journey what? they, say, they oh. say there are two ways to, to build you know, have the tallest building in town one yeah. is to build it right yeah. which is much harder to become a, an actor and actually yeah. practice your craft and work at it every day or become a writer or you know what, whatever you want to do creatively it's much easier to tear everyone else's building down and I think that's one of the other reasons mm. that we get so addicted mm -hmm. to to tearing other people's buildings down or their reputation mm -hmm. down it's the easiest way for us to feel significant. It's very easy, even now, for me to be snarky and be like, ah, oh, you know, look at that, you know, I can't believe what that person's wearing or doing or whatever, mm -hmm. because in that moment, it gives me this burst of significance, but there's nothing really meaningful to it. Hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, it's really a projection. I think like one other side to, to the, the quote from Freedom that, and now I feel like I'm focusing on sort of more the downsides of fame, so I'll try and see it from a more balanced uh, viewpoint, hopefully at some point during the podcast but uh something that people i don't think consider with like child stardom is how you're famous for like imagine being famous for your middle school band that's what it's like to <laughs> mm. be famous from a nickelodeon show you know what mm. i mean like imagine if people were just for the rest of your life like oh my god that bass line in in the song my crush was so good and you're like oh my god i wrote that when i was 11 this oh. is so embarrassing and that's sort of just what you're always um, dealing with and it feels like I yeah just it feels very uh, it's, it's well, brutal I could see where it would like keep you stuck in the past too yeah yeah, yeah for we're sure. like and yeah I mean that's and you see that happen a lot I mean we were kind of talking about this yesterday when we were recording with Peter about how you know you'll have an artist to come out uh, and put out an album that's amazing and then they try to do something different but then People just want to latch on to that first album. They right. don't want to like give the second album a chance sometimes. Yeah, they sure. all, they wanted James Gandolfini to always be Tony Soprano. Yeah. No right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's like no matter what other role he does, you're like you're going to watch Tony Soprano play uh, to play <laughs> you know, a general in the military or or, or whatever. Yeah. And it, you know what's what's fascinating about about what you're saying there is I think I'm thinking about the story from you know Vanessa Carlton the yeah. the the singer. Sure. She wrote her biggest hit when she was 16 years old and it's uh, a thousand miles right yeah. and i've seen her in concert a few times we have a friend who plays violin for her um who we've been on tour with and uh shout out to sky steel yeah he's, he's awesome. good dude um but anyway she wrote that song when she was 16 and i think she had a, a sort of adversarial relationship with that song for probably about a decade mm. because it was like Oh, I wrote this thing and this is what I'm known for. This is what you showed up to, to watch. It's the reason you all are here, but like I'm so much more than this song. Sure. But then she sort of formed a detente with it by the time she was 30 and realized like, wow, this song has afforded me this amazing career that's allowed me to expand beyond this sort of pop piano song yeah and i should actually be grateful for it and now there's this weird yeah. thing where she does it at her concerts now and she's you can tell she's actually grateful for the song she doesn't identify with it necessarily anymore mm -hmm. but it's given her this opportunity to continue to play music today well into her 30s and you can feel that difference in how she performs it now yeah for that's sure cool. that's really cool yeah and, and so i think maybe there's this 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 period where yes being known for y your your eighth grade your, your junior high times like I could see where I would be like I don't want I'm not that person anymore I'm not even close to that person anymore mm -hmm. but maybe it's also a springboard for being a better version of myself now uh, and I don't know maybe it's sort of a 
a maturation. Although I, sure. you've, I'm sure you've seen a, a sort of maturation what you're doing because you're writing and directing now, which is much different from what you were doing as a teenager. Yeah. Well, I guess now, as I'm thinking about it, like I, I wrote this article uh, about eating disorders and my history with eating disorders, and when people approach me about that, which is you know happened quite often since since it, it came out. I, it's a totally different um, reaction that I have. I feel so much more connected to the person who's talking to me. Usually they've had uh, struggles with eating disorders themselves and I feel like I'm able to talk to them. And I think that's a thing that I felt like was really missing from uh, maybe the past where when people would just kind of you know, scream at me from afar or, you know, just take us want to take a selfie real quick. It's like it's a different level of bond that I feel with the people who read that. And I don't, I'm not sure, um, I, I'm not sure I would I would feel uh, as positively as I feel now if it weren't for kind of putting my own stuff out there and having people connect with that. Well, that makes sense. They're connecting with you now instead of a, a fictional a f- character. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, instead of a character. <clears throat> yeah. Well, Lauren, I'm going to send you a copy. Uh, so you talked about um, well, you talked about a few things here, but relationships is, is one thing because uh, that, that I would really like to dive deep into. We don't have time to do it right now. So I'm gonna send you a copy of our book, uh, Minimalism, Live a Meaningful Life. There is a chapter in there about relationships and really identifying the people in your life that aren't toxic relationships. Because if you have people in your life who are trying to tear you down, whether you're famous or not, that's not a recipe for, for success. So reprioritizing your relationships is something that I found to be really important in my own life. Surrounding my self with people who are supportive, but also who share similar values to me. So I think you'll enjoy a, a copy of Minimalism, Live a Meaningful Life. Sean, if you could reach out to her, send her the audio book version, or if you want the book book or the ebook, we'll send those to you as well. Also, since you're in Tampa, you know, we own a coffee shop down, well, it's in St. Pete, so it's in the Tampa Bay area. <laughs> uh, it is the best coffee in the Tampa Bay area. It is definitely the best coffee. <laughs> and, and I know, I mean, we are biased, yeah. but we have very little to do with the fact that it's the best coffee. That is true. Yeah. In the Tampa Bay area. Now, Ryan, you were just down there and oh, we started uh, serving food recently. Yeah, I tasted everything on the menu and <laughs> our chef is killing it. Like, it is unbelievable. Yeah, it's so, so good. So, <clears throat> Bandit Coffee. Um, Lauren, I'm going to send you into Bandit Coffee. We'll give you a bag of coffee and a free drink and a free meal if you want that as well. Sean, if you could send that to her as well. Maybe we'll just give her a gift card from from Bandit. That would be great. Uh, BanditCoffee.co is the website if anyone is interested. Oh, and we have the Minimalist Choice Coffee now too. The Minimalists.coffee is the website for that. We have another question here from Chris in Minneapolis. Hey, this is Chris in Minneapolis. I came across someone who was uh, tweeting some pretty racist things one time, and I uh, did a quick click through his Twitter and kind of saw a reverse evolution of a normal Twitter user to kind of a racist supremacist, I guess. And so I just uh, tweeted him a riddle uh, that was pretty easy for him to know. That was actually his actual address, kind of like, hey, you're not anonymous. And once I tweeted him that, you know, his Twitter came down and his website came down. And so uh, I hope... You know, the key has changed, but, um, you know, when people actually have to be out in public, uh, they probably would act differently, like kind of the anonymousness. So I would say the good thing about being um, fame is that you have influence, but also if you've been trying to negatively influence people in a harmful way, uh, that can do a lot of damage. So yeah, let's talk about the the good thing about fame or or being well known. And I tend to agree with what Chris is saying here. Mm-hmm. Hmm. You do have some influence. What's the Spider Man line, Ryan? Oh, uh, with great res- wait, with great power comes great responsibility. Yeah, I think that that's true. <clears throat> Unfortunately, it's often squandered. That that yeah. great power is well, squandered. Well, it's interesting too because like I I think I would start to get a little political, especially like back in two thousand and sixteen. Hmm. But I, I have since like stopped. I only did that for a little bit, and I realized that like there are certain things though I don't want to touch on because it's so divisive. Mm-hmm. But yeah. in the same token, we could do things like um, campaigns for charity water, and we can you know do some some philanthropic things with that influence. Yeah, I mean, and so so that's actually a really good example. So just last Friday, I, I met with uh, um, some folks from Uplift, which is this uh, uh, organization here in in Hollywood that helps children and families um, basically from very similar upbringings to what you and I had yeah. where there's a lot of drug and uh, substance abuse in the house and 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 helps the children in those households without prying them away from the family mm-hmm. sort of retrains the family in a way and so Ryan and I have done a lot of 
things that are uh, with charity or, or philanthropic. And the only reason we've been able to do that to the scale that we have is because we do have some influence. So it's not just the two of us doing it. It's bringing other people into the fold and encouraging them to contribute. Yeah. That's using it responsibly. Mm-hmm. I do agree that, that sometimes it makes sense to get involved politically, but I I think it only makes sense in the traditional sense of the word politics, you know, from the the Latin root means the affairs of the city. Mm -hmm. And if we're talking about the affairs of of the populace, Mm -hmm. then yeah, to get involved politically sounds great. But if we're trying to yell at people on Twitter because we don't like the D or the R in front of their name, I don't find that to be particularly useful or helpful. Often it's very cynical, but also it seems that it gets in the way of what else we're trying to do. If you and I were to go out there and either yell about Trump or support Trump or vice versa for the other side, mm-hmm. it, it it would probably get in the way of a message that is actually helping people, I think. Yeah. It might be a little disingenuous, too. Like, to Chris's point, like, I wouldn't be yelling about the D or the R to anyone on the street. And I, Ooh, yeah. you know what I'm saying? It's like, and it's I think it's important to note, too, like, social media, we have to we have to realize that it is a very fake world. Like my social media self, even me, like, yeah, there's these cool moments of me snowboarding and some trips that I've been on, but it doesn't really express my entire life. Right. Mm. But unfortunately, sometimes like we look at social media and we try to mimic like a person's life. Like that's, it's like running after the, a sunset. Like you're never going to catch it. <laughs> it's, but you can see it, <laughs> but you're never actually going to get there. So you've had some some interactions on on social media, and I'm sure that it's it's difficult to keep up with that. We call it a Twitter stream for a reason. You can't take it all in, right? Yeah. You can sort of dip your toe in the water. Yeah, I uh, I kind of I stopped social media a, a few years ago. Like I completely deleted all my tweets. Um, I signed off of Instagram. I stopped using Facebook for about a year and a half just because I needed to focus on my mental health and and you know working through eating disorders and there was just bigger fish to fry it and I, I, I couldn't handle kind of the stress and the pressure of social media and the idea of trying to chase a sunset or make my life look like a sunset or whatever mm-hmm. I was trying to do uh, and I think the time off was hugely helpful in kind of re resetting and figuring out what is it that I really want to put out there how do I want to you know influence people what do I want to portray um, what do I want to yeah what what foot do I want to put forward in terms of social media and um but I think the break was really helpful. I, 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 I'd, I think, you know, more people, if, if you could do a social media break and, and kind of reset your batteries, I think it's a really helpful thing to do. Yeah. I feel like we have a good level of, uh, like it's the perfect level of fame in the sense that we can be recognized somewhere in Los Angeles pretty, pretty easily, but we don't have like millions of followers because, you know, the more followers you have, like the more haters you have, the more yeah. trolls you have. And certainly we get trolled every once in a while. Like, you know, there's, well, when you call yourselves really? the, min- well, when you call yourselves the minimalists, everything you do becomes steeped in irony. Like I'll be at the grocery store yeah, yeah, yeah. and I'll have like, you know, six lemons in my hand and no joke, like this actually happened. This guy came up to me. He's like, it's not a very minimalist amount of lemons you have in your arms there. <laughs> <laughs> and he like, he was making a joke and it was, it was lighthearted. Like he wasn't really actually trying to be a jerk, but yeah, 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 sure. But, but we certainly do like, you know, have to deal with that stuff. Um, th- do you experience a lot of trolls at all on, on social media or? I genuinely, when I say I don't check, I don't check. Like I don't uh. want to read the comments because um I wish it I wish I didn't get affected by them but I think sometimes it's easy to it's easy to if you're in a bad mood or whatever if I start from a kind of vulnerable place and I check the last thing I need is to see some troll bashing me yeah. then I think it's just gonna you know unravel things I don't I don't read comments either like I'll Good. read I'll read I'll read Twitter mentions yeah. because there are some really genuine people who want you know who have a question that I would yeah. be more than happy to answer but like when it comes to our YouTube videos we have a lovely lady named Jess Williams who does all of her social media mm. and she kind of deals with all the trolls but I specifically don't do it uh-huh. because it's like there could be 20 awesome comments yeah. but then there's one comment that's like Ryan your hair looks like a mess and I'm like <laughs> oh my hair looks like a mess like and it just takes <laughs> away from all that good well that, it's that yeah. New Yorker cartoon remember the one we yeah. had we, oh, so yeah, there was, was this good. New Yorker cartoon yeah. that we, we cut out and had on the podcast it was this uh, this this guy who was on stage and he was looking out at the audience. He had just finished performing and they're like all giving him a standing ovation, except there's like one person in the middle, sort of frowning or yeah. scowling. Sitting at him. down with his arms crossed. Yeah, like. and he's like, 
and he looks down and he goes they all hate me yeah like, that, that's kind of what social media is like it's yeah, yeah, so yeah. many people are like oh this is awesome this is great whatever and then you see that one person and it will just screw up your whole hour or afternoon or right. day yeah right. and uh and i think that that's because we st- our brain still treats it like that person's in front of us, yeah. right? And these are rarely things someone would say in front of you, uh, yeah. I- unless they had you know some sort of, yeah. I mean, some of the behavior, and I mean this sincerely, the, some of the behavior on on social media is like semi autistic. Like mm-hmm. someone would not oh, say yeah. this in person, but they don't realize like. It, we've been given carte blanche. Uh, our friend Jamie Kilstein, he's a comedian. Uh, he's hilarious. He just yesterday, uh, well, the day we're recording this, uh, he he put out a, a video called How to Argue on Twitter. Sean, you got to put a link to this in the show notes. I haven't seen it yet, man. If you're easily offended, don't watch it. But, <laughs> oh, my God, it's hilarious. Um, but it's it's... Obviously, it's not actually how to argue on Twitter, but this is how people argue on Twitter. They get really outraged for no reason at all. They do no <laughs> research. They don't read the article. They read the headline, and they respond to it with massive amounts of mm. anger yeah. almost immediately, and then sort of wash their hands and, <laughs> and move on. Yeah. 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 Well, social media is a very, it's a very uh, easy spot for people to express their anger. And, mm. and I don't, it, it is partly because it's anonymous, so people feel like, oh, I can go ahead and like stir the pot here yeah. because you know people aren't going to know exactly who I am. But there are some people who they're not anonymous and they'll stir the pot and then they go to try to get a job later. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then their employer's uh, like, uh, oh, uh, sorry, like six months ago you were going on racist rants. We don't really hire people who, who go on racist rants. Well, and that's a weird thing too about <laughs> these the, the people who try to call out other people for like these purity tests. I'm sure you heard about the guy in Iowa who was a journalist who who called out the guy who raised... You see the guy who, who's holding up a sign at like a football game and said, send me beer money and here's my Venmo account number. Oh, yeah. Well, they, he, earned, he made like $3 million. <laughs> no way. And so, yeah, here's what he did. But here's what he did. He donated all $3 million to like this child's charity. Oh, wow. To a, a children's hospital. Wow, that's oh, amazing. Wow. Instead of keeping the $3 million. That's cool. <laughs> but then this journalist dug up like some raci- racist or, or semi-racist tweets from him I don't know, three, five, ten years ago. Yeah. And and it's like, okay, does that erase the fact that he did this amazing thing? Okay, maybe he said something that was terrible. But he also did something that was truly amazing. However, hmm. other people then went and dug up semi-racist tweets the Iowa journalists found. Oh, and my God. First off, I'm like, how many people are sending <laughs> racist tweets? To me, one of the things that is really nice about being well known or in the public spotlight is probably a better way to say this is is I feel like I have to act congruently and mm. and, and what I mean by that is like I I, that. I act in private not the same exact way I would in public I do have a private life <laughs> but I also wouldn't be ashamed if if anything from my private life were to also come out in public mm. right and and it doesn't mean I there are, there are certainly things like I send some pictures to my wife that I don't want published publicly <laughs> and most of you don't want to see but I also wouldn't be like oh I'm so ashamed of that it's just yeah. like well no that's something private that we share intimately with each other yeah but there's nothing to be ashamed about and so living sure. congruently being the person I want to be both privately and publicly it has it has I won't say forced me to do that, but it has certainly encouraged me to live to be a, a better version of myself. Now, I love that. Uh, yeah. uh, I, I think that with the article, we're going to get into your article here in a little bit. We'll, we'll talk about, because you were sort of living two different lives, a public life and, and a, a private life, and, and you sort of hid the shame. And I want to talk a lot about that because I thought it was it was... Uh, it was just amazing that you you shared the story, but you also did so with quite a bit of of humor. And I often say that that life's most difficult or dark or tragic situations have to be dealt with with some bit of humor in order for us to be able to even digest it. Otherwise, it's so dark right. that that we can't deal with it. That's so I love that. It's so articulate. So we're gonna get to that in a moment. But first, uh, let's move on to our right lightning round where we answer your text messages. Uh, you can text your questions to nine three seven two zero two four six five four. Those text messages 
literally go right to Ryan's phone and my phone. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's really us. You are texting us directly. Uh, we will answer our favorite questions on the podcast or we'll respond to you directly via text message. Now, just to be clear, we can't answer every question via text message. We've had thousands of them come in, but uh, we've, between the two of us, have literally answered thousands of text oh, yeah. messages yeah. just over the last few weeks. It's kind of fun, man. Like, I'll just take an hour and, like, start responding to people and Same. Mm -hmm. blows their mind. They're like, is this really Ryan? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, yes. I, I will respond back like, <laughs> no, it's a robot. <laughs> <laughs> uh, They'll be like, send me a picture with a spoon on your head. And then I'm like, no, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we will respond to as many people as we can. We'll either answer it on the podcast or we will answer your question uh, directly via text message. And like I said, yes, it's really us responding to you. 937-202-4654. What question do we have, Ryan? we got a question from William. When will people start to think deeper about the concept of fame and begin to understand its false promises? Well, I think this is one of the bigger problems now is fame has become the objective rather than a byproduct yeah mm -hmm. people now often and, and maybe social media has enabled this maybe youtube has enabled this i actually notice people from your generation yeah. often speak in follower counts like i have mm -hmm. a couple of good friends who are millennials who like they'll t hey, i just had a million followers on this platform or whatever yeah. and i'm like okay like like yeah no like my younger brothers and sisters who are millennials they'll be like how does it feel to have you know fifty thousand or si I don't even know how many Instagram followers I have but th they know yeah, yeah, how does yeah, it feel yeah. to have sixty thousand Instagram followers I'm like does it feel much different when I had ten thousand Instagram <laughs> followers <laughs> yeah it's like there there is not this this uh, level of 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 contentment or happiness now there there is also but there is this reinforcement of maybe i am doing something right mm -hmm. but the problem is when that becomes the outcome mm. i think you're never going to be happy with it right no. because because Absolutely. you you can take your millions of followers and be like i can't believe but kanye west has tens of millions <laughs> of, of of followers or you know uh kim kardashian has hundreds of millions of followers i'm so inadequate or incomplete or, or whatever right as opposed to that being the byproduct of adding value in some way. And so when Ryan and I, what we try to do with this podcast, regardless of whether it gets 10,000 downloads or 10 million downloads, we try to add value. And then ideally what happens is people then share it, follow it, download it, mm -hmm. subscribe to it for the right reasons, mm -hmm. as opposed to... Uh, the, the analogy I often think of is a, is a car crash, right? Uh, people often want to do something. They want to create a viral moment or something, yes, right? Yes. Ryan and I have never had anything that's ever gone viral. Uh, I'm not opposed to it. If something were to, were to happen, great. But if you're seeking sort of virality, by yeah. the way, think about what that means for a second. Viral, like mm -hmm. it's a virus. <laughs> uh, we usually don't, it's the only context that we seek out viruses. Yeah. Uh, in a in a somewhat positive way, yeah. Uh, but uh, we don't seek out virality. Uh, but what we have done is like slowly over the course of a decade, been able to help people solve problems, add value mm -hmm. as much as we can, and then people tend to to share the message and, and share the story. And I find that the outcome for us has never been what's the largest possible audience we mm -hmm. can get. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, if that was the case, dude, like we would just do nothing but home tours. I mean, like I, I think some of our most popular videos on YouTube are we did some like apartment tours oh, of I our see. place. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So so like that's uh, that's great. And I'm very happy to get those views. But if we were going off of just numbers, well, then we would just start being like, OK, what's Constant the next? How tours. can we spin the home tour? Yeah. What other videos can we do? That yes, that'll, that'll, yes, yes. Yeah. And, oh my like, God. and that's the car crash. Right. And yeah. So, so like, yes. well, the problem, though, is. What's great about that is if someone shows up for the home tour and then they stay for all the other things, they're like, oh, wow, they start asking and answering some real important questions, philosophical questions about what does it mean to live a meaningful life with less? What are some mm -hmm. questions I should ask about my own consumption, et cetera, et cetera. But if we didn't have that and we just had home tours, then it would be constantly trying to get more clicks or views. And it's you're, you're going to continue to up the threshold. And so the, yeah. the car crash turns heads, but no one ever stays to watch <laughs> the car crash. Mm -hmm. right. They see the car crash, but then they keep going by. Looking for the next car crash. Right. <laughs> and, and then what are you going to have to do next time? Well, ne uh, one car crash isn't going to do it. Now I have to do something that's sort of yeah. more... 
suffusive or, or, well, or something. I imagine your guys' fan base, well, me being a fan, a huge fan, is that it, I, I, I imagine your community is so loyal and probably, probably much more loyal. Like, when I was getting into just minimalism in general, I wa- I tried watching a lot of YouTube videos on minimalists, and I think what was really apparent to me was how your guys' intention was really different mm. than what a lot of other people were doing with minimalism. I felt, um, you know, you could just kind of see the, the copy and paste-ness nature of, of people's videos, and I, I, I felt like the intention, the intention with a lot of people, I thought was maybe just to be trendy, or like, oh, this mm. is a cool thing that's happening right now, so I'm gonna, you know, be a minimalist, and I, I didn't get anything out of out of their content i felt like well, okay, okay i have a clean apartment now cool what's next mm. um, that's, that's the you big know thing. a lot of a lot of it is how and I, i'm okay with the how everyone knows how to declutter their clothes sure. sure you're like sure. oh okay i get rid of some of the clothes i'm not wearing piles, right. Yeah. right it's like donate and so okay i've got that but then what do i fill not just my closet with but my life with when i and and understanding not just the how and the what but the why behind Mm. it why is my life going to be better with less and Mm -hmm. what are the benefits for me and and going a little bit deeper the how stuff is is important and it's sort of a first step quite often but if you don't understand why then that closet will be recluttered within a month or two months or whatever yeah yeah Yeah, but, but to your point we do have awesome fans and they are like super loyal and it's crazy like when we have these big venues filled up with people yeah. when they leave like the venues are typically clean like they're not leaving their beer cups everywhere <laughs> like we have some very quality fans mm. uh, speaking <laughs> of this is a lightning round uh, we try to answer questions with a short shareable less than 140 character <laughs> response <laughs> <laughs> uh, we, we copy and and, and we, we actually paste our uh, uh, pithy answers in the show notes they're called minimal maxims you can also find them at minimalmaxims.com i've got a short pithy answer for you here uh to william's question remember his question was when will people start to think deeper about the concept of fame and begin to understand its false promises and my pithy answer to that is we often don't want what we think we want Mm. what i mean by that is we don't understand why we want it often people think they want to be famous Mm -hmm. and then the dog catches the car and they don't know what to do with it right and uh, Jeanette, you you had a a level of of fame early on that was probably ho- pretty difficult to carry. Yes, uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> how, how did how do you feel like that you? What did you do to cope with that? Uh, stepping away from everything. I I, I quit acting. Um, entirely because I felt like I needed to do that. Um, you know, earlier I mentioned kind of the breakdowns of former child stars and I felt like I was having a private breakdown mm-hmm. and I knew um, with how the press was at that time um, toward me, I knew that all it took was, you know, one one misstep and it, I would just become another one of those and the story would become very publicized and it would become just, I, 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 I felt that, um, that energy of like, oh God, this is going to be a public breakdown. I felt it looming. Mm. So I just, I I quit and it was a, a hard decision, but I felt like I needed to do it. Um, yeah, I think I think it was really important for me. And, you know, I I, I think I needed to, to completely step away. I don't think that's the case for everybody, no. you know, but, but for me it yeah. was. I think it's great. You, like you had the courage to be able to do that because a lot Thanks. of, a lot of people would just keep plowing through and yeah so uh, so my family thought i was nuts they were like how can you walk away from this and you know you're throwing all this away and and i had to deal with kind of their their judgments and then um i was very lucky i have very three very supportive brothers who were just Mm. so so helpful during that time that's great the answer there is instead of carrying it you can set many things that everything that you've picked up you can set down is Mm. there when that's, you, yeah, that's pithy. Yeah, that's pithy. That is pithy. <laughs> when you like, when you think about that arc that you experience of fame, yeah, I mean, of course, hindsight's twenty twenty. Right. Is there any like, what advice do you wish you would have given yourself? Like, is there anything that that you can think of? If not, no worries. Hmm. Kind of put you on the spot there. Yeah, no, it's it, well, it's it's tough because my my mom was initially the person who had wanted me to to act, and I do think that's a that's the case for a lot of child actors is that you know maybe. 
I think it's more common than not that maybe they came from a kind of poor or family and maybe there was some pressure on them to support the family or mm. um so so in that sense it's hard because it's it's not you don't really have a choice I don't think when when yeah. you're a kid and you and you've got the the parental pressure and everything. Yeah. Um but Yeah, it kind of wasn't up to you. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it really wasn't. And you know, I was 6 when my mom put me in it and was just like you're going to pay the bills, kid. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but so so I think by the time you are, you know, by the time I was well shoot because then by the time I was 18 I was in these contracts and so it really didn't feel like it was up to me either um, at that point you know and when you become 28 or 38 or 48 it often still doesn't feel like it's up to you because we, we get bogged down by a lot of the obligations that we think we have to fulfill and we feel the the pressure or at least the pressure we think that is there mm -hmm. but most of that pressure is internal and, and maybe there might be some mm. outside forces that have some unrealistic expectations. Right. But we can also set aside the unrealistic expectations because you're never going to be able to fulfill other people's expectations completely. Right. Just look at if, if you have 500 Facebook f uh, friends, Ryan, mm -hmm. imagine trying to fulfill just all of their surface level expectations. You never could even do that. Right. Mm -hmm. Multiply that by a thousand or a million. Yeah. You, you can't you, you can't fulfill those expectations and so i think quite often what we need to do is is have better expectations by having fewer expectations mm. but also having yeah. better standards for ourselves. and and for the longest time from the time you were six until you were 18 where you didn't have dominion over your own life you had other people who were the standard bearers for you mm. yes and maybe yeah. they weren't making the best decisions for you yeah, and I think I think that's what's that's what's difficult to think of. Well, what would I have told myself? Because I don't I don't know if it, if I even would have had the wherewithal to be able to implement anything that I could have yeah. told myself because the choice just didn't you know feel like it was mine. Yeah. Um, mm. Yeah, I wish I could. I, I wish there was something. No, no. I you mean, know? I, I think you covered it well. I mean, it's it's uh, it is difficult as a child to to do to make your own decisions yeah mm -hmm. everything is being forced on you so yeah i mean maybe there isn't like a a solid piece of advice you can give a six-year-old you know i mean that's yeah that's totally understandable uh my pithy answer would be this what you're chasing isn't as important as why you're chasing it so you know fame isn't bad i don't mm -hmm. think fame is is horrible mm -hmm. the problem is is like if you're just chasing fame well then you're chasing the audience you're chasing the contracts you're chasing the money mm -hmm. you're chasing the followers and like that is where you start to put aside living a meaningful life mm. uh, for this fame that you're chasing. So, you know, uh, I don't think you and I are famous at all. Uh, I mean, someone would come up and be like, oh, you're famous. You're the minimalist. But but let's say like it's we have some level of fame. <laughs> yes. right? Let's say we have some level of fame. Uh -huh. Like, but it is that's the like you said earlier it's the byproduct of what we do right so there's nothing wrong with being famous uh if you're someone who wants to be famous like really sit down and ask yourself why do you want to be famous if it's because mm -hmm. you have this grandiose plan of some philanthropic thing that you want to do in the world then like great chase it but if you're doing yeah, it if, if fame will enable you to do some really amazing things yeah then I mean, the, the, my golly go for it yeah yeah but like if you're just chasing fame for the the, the sake of being famous well, uh, it's you're 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 chasing a sunset. It's funny, like I love that Jim Car Carrey quote, the great philosopher Jim Carrey, <laughs> who says, "I wish everyone could become rich and famous so that they could see that being rich and famous isn't the answer to life." Mm -hmm. And uh, it's it's so true. And unfortunately, there's a lot of a lot of. I mean, this question, like, when are people going to realize? Unfortunately, a lot of people don't realize until. A, they either like chase and then they you know they 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 lose the chase or they actually get famous, but they don't learn until you know, until it's too late. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, but you know, that's why Josh and I do what we do. We really try to help express what we have learned through our lives, whether it's chasing the corporate career or chasing the money right, or whatever right. it is, like trying to help people see the mistakes that we've made and hopefully they can learn from the mistakes that we've done. Yeah. Have you made some mistakes along the way? Oh my God. <laughs> Countless. <laughs> oh, jeez. Oh boy. Um... Yeah, so so many. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Me too. Me too. All right, before we dive into our added value segment and our listener tips today, it looks like we got a bunch more surprise questions this week. Do you think that with fame comes social responsibility? How do you navigate around the predators in the business in Hollywood? At what point does fame become toxic? Jeanette, what is your advice to young people navigating a world where personal branding and fame is becoming less of a choice and more of an obligation? You know, I've noticed that more and more and more people are talking about branding themselves. Mm. 
We isn't it isn't it like a uh, uh, kids these days like the number one thing they want to be is a YouTube influencer? Yeah, in the United States, that that's that's true. Yeah, they want to be a, a a brand. So we're gonna talk a lot about that. Also, uh, this tweet from Jeanette. We're gonna talk about. I'm glad my mom died. Hmm. We'll uh, we'll have to dive deep into that. Also, Jeanette has agreed to talk about. Um, well, she wrote this article about her eating disorder that she struggled with since age 11. Uh, for a long time and she really opened up about it and we're going to have her talk about that and dive into it and I think uh, it's going to help a lot of people plus we got a bunch more questions and things to talk about with Jeanette McCurdy and if you want to hear all that listen to this week's maximal episode that's right you're currently listening to our minimal episode but each week Ryan and I and our guests we record an entirely different much longer much more personal maximal episode and let me say this it is entirely separate endeavor from our minimal episodes we, we put this minimal episode out there it's free it's advertisement free and it helps a lot of people it gets mm -hmm. a lot of downloads and we have a very small audience uh, limited to six thousand people where over on patreon uh, we have the minimalist private podcast and it's a separate endeavor they're completely separate episodes it's not an extended version of this it's a totally separate enterprise on its own and each week we do a maximal episode. Now, you can get a personal link to that if you become a supporter. And that personal link or that podcast episode plays in your favorite podcast app. So you don't have to go to your web browser and listen on there. Uh, there are multiple ways you can listen, but you can also listen on your favorite podcast app. And so you can find all the details to that. It's the best way for us to keep this podcast 100% advertisement free. And you can support us over at theminimalists.com slash support. And with that, you get an additional private podcast episode every week, and plus a bunch of other things that we do just for our Patreon audience. Ryan, what else you got for us this week? Here are some voicemail comments and tips from our listeners. Check them out. Hello, my name is Kenny Hansen, um, and I live in California. I have been a fan of The Minimalist for a few years now, and I have been on The Minimalist journey, I would say, for about two and a half years um, almost about three. And recently, um, I ran into a poem that I thought I'd call in and share with listeners. It is a poem by Mary Oliver, and it's called Storage. When I moved from one house to another, there were many things I had no room for. What does one do? I rented a storage space, and I filled it. Years pass. Occasionally, I went there and looked in, but nothing happened. Not a single twinge of heart. As I grew older, the things I cared about grew fewer, but were more important. <clears throat> so one day, I undid the lock and called the trash man. He took everything. I felt like the little donkey when his burden is finally lifted. Things. Burn them, burn them. Make a beautiful fire. More room in, in your heart for love, for the trees, for the birds who own nothing, the reason they can fly. And I thought that this poem was so beautiful and absolutely the perfect description for minimalism. It is simply making more room in your life for the things that matter. I think for some people, they have a hard time grasping the purpose of minimalism. And they think of extremists who have a certain amount of items that they can have in their life. But I think that that's not it. That's not what's being shared. Not proselytized, but shared um, by Joshua and Ryan. It's simply... <clears throat> it's simply making room in your life for meaningful things. I hope this tip helps for people who are having a little bit of a trouble grasping what minimalism truly is. Hi, this is Anna. I live in Indiana. Uh, I called to tell you about how I tried the minimalism thing a while back, and when my mother passed away, I got her belongings. So I realized that minimalism is about getting rid of things that don't matter and then making room for the things that do. So I'm glad that I minimalized what I had, and then when a tragedy hit, I could have my mother's belongings, her clothes, and etc. So that's one plus side about the whole minimalism thing, is that I now treasure what I do have now than what I did before. All right, y'all. Thanks again to Jeanette McCurdy for being with us today and really opening up 
and I want to encourage you to check her out at JeanetteMcCurdy.com. You can find everything that she's doing over there. She has a, a one-woman play that she's working on. Uh, it's a sort of musical, but one-woman show where she's on stage. She's writing and directing films right now. So I would encourage you to check her out. The best place to do that is her online hub, JeanetteMcCurdy.com. We'll put a link to that in the show notes. And real quick, for right here, right now, here's one thing that's going on in the life of the minimalists. It is a brand new year, and a lot of people have New Year's resolutions, Ryan. Mm-hmm. I know you've resolved to wear underwear every single day this year. No, I actually resolved to not wear underwear. Every I single misread day your here. tweet yeah. about that. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, some people, a lot of people are reaching out to me right now because I teach a writing class called How to Write Better. And um, it's not open. Enrollment is closed for that right now. Mm -hmm. But uh, it will be opening up soon. But in the meantime, if you want to learn how to write better, uh, I've created a free ebook that you can download, and it's a really short ebook. E you can read it in less than half an hour. It's called 11 Ways to Write Better. And you can find that over at howtowritebetter.org. That's uh, the website for my writing class, but you can get the free ebook over there, howtowritebetter.org. You can download 11 Ways to Write Better. You can follow The Minimalists on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at The Minimalists. And if you have a question, comment, or a minimalism tip for our podcast, email a voice memo to podcast at theminimalists.com. You can comment on this episode at youtube.com slash theminimalists. And if you want our show notes in your inbox, then sign up for our email list over at theminimalists.com. We'll never send you spam or junk or advertisements, but we will send you our simple Sunday emails each week in addition to our podcast show notes. And for our added value segment this week, Ryan, we have the perfect song. Since we've been talking about fame today, one of my favorite artists, I think one of the best writers of our time, is a singer-songwriter named Jeffrey Focult. And he has a song from his album, Horse Latitudes, the song is called Everybody's Famous, and it's about, well, it's about how all of us are really trying to, to become famous or reach for that 15 minutes or now 15 seconds of fame. Mm. I saw something recently, Ryan, that said, uh, soon in the future, we'll all, all of us will have 15 minutes of not being famous. <laughs> 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 and we're going to yearn for that 15 minutes yeah. of not being famous to, to some extent. But this is one of my favorite songs. It's called Everybody's Famous by Jeffrey Focolt. Oh, and by the way, I just put out a my my top ten list. Well, it was really it was top eleven list. Don't you always add a couple extra on there? Sometimes, or maybe it's, I'll remove one. There'll be top nine list some <laughs> years. So for the last decade, I've done my favorite albums of the year. So 2019 was a unique year because I had four number one albums. Mm. So I had a four way tie for number one. You can find that over at theminimalists.com/sound. Uh, it's a the essay I wrote. It's called "The Sound of Life," but you can find the the top 11 list over there and Jeffrey Focal has made that list quite a few years whenever he puts out an album he tends to make that that top 10 or top 11 list but here's everybody's famous from Jeffrey Focal and if you leave here today with just one message we hope it's this love people and use things because the opposite never works thanks for listening y'all we'll see you next time the minimalists